Hello. This video is in collaboration with Mark Roberts Motion Control. If you've seen the recent main channel video, you'll know that we now have a robot. <laughs> this is an extremely fast motion control arm specifically designed with high speed cameras in mind. It's called the Bolt and it's very popular on feature films, very high end commercials and such. Motion control systems are frequently used in VFX and that's because they can repeat camera moves that a human never could. For example, if I was wanted a move that did something like this, maybe zoomed in at the end, I would never be able to repeat that twice exactly. If you were to overlay two takes on each other, there would be all kinds of extra movement that even if I tried really hard, I would never be able to get that right. However, motion control is able to repeat pre-programmed moves very precisely. So if I just make a move that pans to the right and zooms in, I can walk about in the background here. I can then say, repeat that exactly, put myself in a different place. And without any visual effects at all, I could just splice that mid shot. And you can't even tell where the cut was. It's that seamless. It's that repeatable. To take that to the next level, I could set the phantom to record 100 instead of 25. That's four times slower. And then to compensate, I'm going to set the robot to move four times faster. So in real time, much faster move. I jump there. But if I play it at 25, it's the exact same move as before, except now I'm in slow-mo in that shot. And I can cut between real time and slow-mo within the same move without any visual effects whatsoever. If I did a little bit of green screen, I could even real time walk behind my slow-mo self if I wanted to. And you can see here that all three shots line up perfectly without any deviations. As you can see from what's written on the side of it, the bolt can move extremely quickly. It can whip this camera around like you wouldn't believe. It's honestly terrifying. So although this can repeat moves exactly like all motion control rigs, we're gonna be using this mainly for its speed. Not doing VFX, but actually getting practical, really fast camera moves. And we saw some of that in the recent Mentos and Diet Soda video where I was able to get angles and shots that I would never have been able to do by hand, mainly because I just can't physically move the camera that fast. And also the timing of certain things, I it would have taken me hundreds of attempts to get the timing as perfect as I could with this and its triggering system. So once again, a big thanks to Mark Roberts Motion Control. I, it was such an honor when they expressed interest in working with the Slow Mo Guys channel for, because to have regular access to something like this is so rare. This is such a unique position and I'm so excited to see what we can get with this. They use these on Marvel movies and stuff. This is like upper tier cinematic equipment. I am so excited. I grin every time I walk in. Shall I stop gushing about it now? Probably. I think the next thing to do is to give it a name. Why don't we call it the dynamically actuating nanobot. It arrived in five of these massive crates, which I've repurposed some of them as tables, <laughs> which is actually quite useful. And it actually requires a three phase power supply to run. Because the bolt is very popular on high end feature films and commercials, you can put pretty much any camera on it. And uh, it comes with this plate. The camera we use on this channel is the Phantom Flex 4K, which Let's be fair, it's a massive camera. It's very big and heavy. We often have very heavy lenses on it. It will fit on the bolt, but with a lens like this, you do risk swinging it around and potentially damaging the mount, or maybe it won't be able to get up to speed as fast as a lighter camera. You may have noticed that it says Phantom VO on this, and that is actually the camera that we're using with the bolt. Looks like this. This camera is basically this camera in a much smaller form factor. So it's lighter and you can mount it in places where you can't mount this honking thing. It's the same exact sensor, the same frame rates, the same resolutions. The main difference is this big one records to Cinemags, which is extremely fast proprietary flash storage. Whereas the VO records to just consumer grade CFast cards, which are much cheaper but much slower to write data to. So there's a bit of a trade-off. So the majority of the time on the Bolt we'll be using this camera along with primes instead of zoom lenses just to keep the whole thing much lighter so the Bolt can be a lot snappier whipping this thing around instead of this. That frees up the original Flex 4K to film the robot itself in slow-mo if we want that angle. I think it's quite interesting to look at footage that the robot got and split screen it with the move in slow-mo 
so you can see the perspective of the behind the scenes. It's like behind the scenes slow-mo, which you wouldn't get in a commercial or a movie, but I think it's quite interesting. I'm gonna include that stuff a lot. This attaches here with four little screws. The camera slides on to the end here and then is tightened up by a single screw. Which is a bit scary at first to put all your faith in one screw, but it's actually held in by the, the shape of this wedge. So that, there's actually very little strain on the screw itself. You don't even need to do it that tight. Just sort of tight-ish. We're now ready to plug the camera in. There'll be four connections to the camera. This one is video out, HDSDI through a BNC cable. That will allow us to see the feed from the camera on a monitor over there. Ethernet, which will allow me to control the camera through my laptop for various playback, savings, trimmings, and all that stuff. Both of these actually plug into the arm of the robot. The robot then has these cables inside and passes them out the back. Behind me here is the trigger, which stops the camera recording. I can actually link that to the software so that the flare software triggers the camera at the beginning or wherever you want it in the move. And finally, power. So the camera can be on <laughs> and we don't have to stick heavy batteries on it. This is a cable that will attach to a motor that will control the lens. Technically not controlling the camera, just the lens motor. The robot is controlled by a piece of software called Flare, where you program in the moves. You, you basically keyframe everything you want the robot to do based on a frame rate. My frame rate here is 25. So for example here, frame zero is the starting position of the camera. And when I start the move, it will perform all of these. By frame 45, the camera will have reached this position, which is all the values of that we'll talk about in a sec. 25 frames a second, so that would take almost two seconds and eventually work its way through all these moves. You can program lots of different positions and do actually very complex moves. They don't all have to be insanely fast. But for example, if I wanted that to move fast, I could change this second position. So instead of taking 45 frames to get there, I could put 10 and it would get there in <laughs> less than half a second. Each row of values is referring to a different part of the robot, which when combined, cause the camera to be in all kinds of different positions and it will move gracefully between those. So you've got rotate, lift, arm, pan, tilt, roll, and when they're plugged in, the motors for the lenses focus and zoom. Changing the speed after the move is programmed will effectively change the speed of the entire thing. So for example, at 25, it will take almost two seconds to go from position one to position two. If I change that to 50 frames a second, it will get from position one to position two in less than a second because it hasn't reached 50 yet. So this is where I sit when I'm doing robot stuff. I control the robot on this PC with flare and uh, I have a live feed of the Phantom on that monitor over there. That's the direct video out. And I control the Phantom on this laptop here. It's a MacBook using parallels to run Windows. And that's how we control the Phantom. Sometimes I have this TV on if I'm over by the robot trying to position something and I, I need to see it big, I can just look at that TV. To program the moves, you basically just steer the robot into positions and save the values in each line. And this is just the numeric view. This is just the raw robot data that it's gonna do. But you can also see a rig model and then play your move and it'll show you a little CG representation of what the move will physically look like. And this will let you know if, you, if you're gonna run into any errors or if it's, the move's not gonna work for some reason. You don't have to physically do it on the, on the robot. For a lot of big Hollywood movies, they'll design moves from like animatics or previs stuff. They'll maybe do that in Maya and import it into Flare. So you can repeat exactly in real life the move you made in animation, which is very cool. So why don't we program a move? Firstly, I will uh, engage the robot. And I'm now in control over different parts. For example, lift, uh, you've got rotate, 
you got the arm, you got some pan, that's just twisting the camera there, tilt, and roll. Now programming moves like that is quite clunky, just steering each piece of the robot into place. There's a much easier way to find camera locations through Cartesians, so I'm going to go into that now. So now that I'm using Cartesians, I can move the camera on different axes without worrying about which part of the robot I need to move. So instead of doing like, okay, rotate, uh, lift, arm, uh, I'm, I'm just moving the camera on an axis and it's much more natural to find a position. So for example, the, the Z axis just moves the camera straight up. It's moving the lift, it's moving the arm, it's moving the tilt all at once, keeping the camera perfectly level. And the great thing about this because I'm a big gamer, the whole thing comes with this little control handheld box. And just using the analog sticks, I can just find moves like that. And it just feels like playing, it feels like controlling a video game in a, like theater mode or something in Halo. So for me, this is my favorite way to find a move because it's, it's really quick. You just sort of steer it into place, like, oh, I need to come down, maybe put it down here, tilt a bit. And then once you found your move, you just store that line and that's your position. And then you can keep going. You want, so say I wanted to move here, looking at me, we'll store that. Boop. And we want to end a bit closer to me. You'll see that I've positioned this desk just out of reach so I don't accidentally uh, knock my own head off with it. So that could be a move. So let's say that is position two on frame 50. So at 25, that is a two second move. So why don't we run that move? Okay, so we'll go to position one. The camera basically will just go to a position. So it's actually not following the program move when I go to a position like that. Um, so you do have to be careful you don't smash it through something in the middle. You can run the move backwards to be more precise with it. But there's nothing in the way of the camera between the moves, so I'm just gonna go. Okay, so in fast mode, this should be a two second move exactly. 50 frames at 25 frames a second. Three, two, one, shoot fast. Pretty good. Now say that's not quite fast enough. I'll just change position two to be 20 frames. <laughs> Go to position one. This is now a move that will occur in less than one second. The exact same move, but instead of taking 50 frames, it will take 20 frames. Three, two, one. <laughs> what if we wanted to go faster than that? What if I could get it over here in 12 frames? Robot fast, forward run. Okay, so it's thrown up a warning here, letting me know that I'm trying to run a move too fast. And it's letting me know here that the rotate axis and the arm axis are over speed by a factor of about 1.2. So it's close, it can almost be done, but not quite. The options it gives me say the fastest move would be 18 frames instead of 12, or I can reduce the overall camera speed to around 21 frames instead of 25 that we're at. So the software has now given me two options. Rescale, which will set this position to occur on frame 18 instead of 12, a little bit more time to get there, or slower, which will slow down the entire speed of the, of the whole move. And um, there's another button. There's a third option, <laughs> which is my favorite thing in this entire piece of software. It's just called run it. Just run the move anyway. Just, it, it's too fast, see what happens. And that's usually not a good idea because A, it's scary, and B, there's only two positions in this move. It's gonna move from one position and try and stop dead in position two. But because of all the different moving parts, when it stops, it's gonna have such velocity behind it that physics doesn't really allow it to stop nice and smooth. It will just land and probably the entire robot will rock around as it lands in that position because there's a lot of moving parts in this thing. It will also cause the camera to pull some serious Gs and uh, it's an expensive camera, I don't wanna break it. But why don't we rescale? We'll do the maximum it thinks it can do it, ready to go to position one. So we're now asking the robot to go from position one to two in about half a second. And I'm just gonna get a little bit further back. It's coming right at me. Just in case the camera flies off, I'm gonna get out of the way.
So with an extremely fast move like that, you probably wouldn't be using the very end of it because it's stopping so quickly it's, it has to settle down afterwards. So you probably want to stick in some extra frames where it slows to that point and ends somewhere else, or you would just use the middle of that action because as an ending point in shot, that probably wouldn't be usable. And that's what this software is all about. It will pro you can see what the move is going to be. It, it will let you know if it's too fast, and then you can add in other positions to smooth out your move. So as you can see, it can get from pretty much one end of its reach to the other in less than a second, and it's very heavy. That's a lot of mass traveling at extremely high velocity. This thing is terrifying. That's why there's so many safety features involved, like uh, the big red light on top that says do not approach. I always turn off the robot if I'm going anywhere near it. But if I want to ch make changes to the camera, the robot's off. There's also emergency stops all over the place, especially where the operator sits. Even on my handheld box, there's an emergency stop because you do have to massively respect this piece of machinery. It cannot see you. It does not care if you're in between positions one and two. <laughs> all right, before we move on, I'm going to secure the end of this dangling cable before I put it straight through the front of the lens. <laughs> so that was a basic sort of two position move just moving from A to B, simple as that. This is a five position move, slightly more advanced, slightly more terrifying. That's <laughs> so fun. It's the handheld box I mentioned before. It's programmable. You can actually replace some of the functions on this. And there's a dead man switch on the back, which you know, usually that would be for if I lose consciousness or let go of this, it will deactivate the robot, but you can program this in the same way you can program all of these. And uh, I've got this set to engage and disengage robot. So you can do a surprising amount from this. I tend to do all my setup on the computer, all the fine tuning, the, I view the rig model and stuff over there. But when I'm finding moves and when I'm running practice moves and then I, when I actually shoot it, I'm usually up and about on this. And I think that's mainly because I just feel right at home on the analog sticks. If there was triggers too, to control the up and down, I think this, this would be perfect. Supposedly, you can actually connect real game controllers to the software. I haven't tried it yet, and honestly, I'm a bit nervous because, you know, an Xbox controller doesn't have an emergency stop on the top of it. And uh, to use this without that, it would freak me out a little bit. Now I have a lens motor on, which means I now have full remote control of the focus as well, like a, a proper follow focus. And anytime I set a position in the software, you know, with all of the other values, it will also save where the focus was if I'm doing you know, some independent focus. However, you can also set it to track objects. So instead of setting focus, you can set the distance of your target. So wherever the robot moves, it will do automatic focus adjustments to keep the subject in focus. And for that to work, you need to tell it a little bit of something about the lens. So we need to do some measurements. So you can see now here, as I move forwards and backwards, it is keeping my subject in focus. And I'm not doing that separately. All I'm doing is pushing forwards and backwards on the analog stick. Here's an example of how different lens values in the software affect the way the camera pans and tilts. Now the robot is moving around a point right in front of the probe lens. And for some reason, this is just so satisfying to watch. <laughs> I love it. In my spare time, I've actually been experimenting with this robot for many months. You may have noticed that there's a load of powder paint <laughs> still underneath it. And that's because the week I received it, I was working on the powder paint mousetrap video, which I filmed just on the floor around here. And after I'd set them all off, I thought, you know what, I'm going to use the robot to try and get a pickup. So I reset up about a quarter of the mousetraps just under here. And then I programmed a move that just swept along them as they all went off. And there were a few comments on that video that were like, wait, how did you get that shot? Where was the camera? Because it wasn't in the wide. And it was basically, I just reset up some of them. And uh, here's the footage from that. I also used it in this configuration with the probe lens when I was filming how this film camera worked and I programmed a little move to just sort of go around the outside of it. All 
All right, now I'm gonna upload a voice profile that I think best matches the personality of the robot. And uh, then I'll be able to communicate with it. So let's try this. Okay, Dan, can you hear me? AB. AB. How have you been? Not bad. Uh, something feels a bit different though. A bit stiff. Yeah, a little bit stiff. Not quite used to it. I'll give you a bit of oil if you want. Yeah, I wouldn't mind a bit of oil to be fair. Yeah, I'll give you a bit of oil. What do you want to do now? Good question. Pub? Pubby. Pub. Well, there we go. Hopefully you enjoyed learning a little bit about how the bolt works. I'm only scratching the surface of it in this video, but as I improve with it, I'll hopefully put it to some great use in upcoming videos. Make sure you subscribe to the main channel if you want to see those videos, and this channel too if you want to see more behind-the-scenes stuff. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.